Hey guys, it's the V.C. Andrews Critiquer. Most people are familiar with the story of Romeo and Juliet, William Shakespeare's most famous play after Hamlet, and they should because it's a captivating story. And it's definitely had a share of adaptations over the years, some great and some not so great. But I'd say the most famous adaptation would have to be a musical that put the story in a rather different setting. Uh, no, this one was still live action and had humans. And could be enjoyed by people older than eight. There we go. West Side Story. So what's the story of West Side Story? Well, it's not just the basic premise of Romeo and Juliet with two lovers and a forbidden romance. It's largely the exact same plotline, only in this version, the Capulets and Montagos are 50s teenage street gangs known as the Sharks and Jets, respectively. And even though they have many things in common, like moxie, badassery, and the desire to annoy the hell out of the hapless Officer Krupke and Lieutenant Shrank in any way they can, find they just can't stand each other's guts. So at a school dance one night, both groups decide to have a rumble, the loser of which has to steer clear of the streets of Manhattan forever. But a more pleasant exchange also occurs at that dance, namely between former Jets leader Tony Tony and the sister of the Sharks leader Bernardo Maria. Maria's the sister. And like Romeo and Juliet, the two quickly go from singing and calling out to each other on the balcony to marriage just like that. But when the rumble has less than optimal results for Tony's best friend Riff and Maria's brother Bernardo, things don't look much more promising than the ending of the original Romeo and Juliet story for the pair. Though not the most iconic musical in all of Broadway, it was still quite the success, winning two Tonys. Very funny. Thank you, running for 732 performances and is still quite popular to this day, and as such, it got two awesome film adaptations from two acclaimed directors. The first was released in 1962, directed by Robert Wise, known for classics like The Day the Earth Stood Still, The Haunting, Sand Pebble, and another film adaptation of a hit musical, The Sound of Music. And the second was released in 2021 from director Steven Spielberg, known for Jaws, E.T., An American Tale, Schindler's List, and Jurassic Park. Both movies were highly revered by critics and audiences, but what about their financial earnings? Well, the original was a respectable financial success, but the new film made the very boneheaded mistake of going up against Spider-Man No Way Home, a movie in which all three of Sony's Spider-Man incarnations joined forces with Doctor Strangelove, well, it's kind of debatable how much he really helps, but I don't want to spoil too much. Against the majority of Spider-Man's villains, like the Lizard, Electro, Sandman, Doc Ock, and led by his archenemy, the Green Goblin, who's twice as evil now and ten times as Defoe-style hammy and hilarious. But do not forget the twice as evil part. Without any spoilers, let's just say I know Peter won't. And the ending? Again, I will not dare spoil it for you, but let's just say you're going to buy a ticket in advance for the sequel right after you see it to find out what happens next. Trust me. So as you might expect, the new film didn't stand a chance against possibly the most legendary Marvel crossover since The Avengers, and was a pretty big financial loss for Disney and Spielberg. Kind of ironic though, since Disney owns Marvel now, though not the Sony Spider-Man series, so I imagine Sony got all the money while Disney got zilch. But this is a review of West Side Story, not Spider-Man No Way Home, and financial earnings aside, the remake is considered a masterpiece and will probably go down in history just as much as it's predecessor from over 60 years ago, but while both movies are great, one is ultimately slightly better, and that's what I'm here to find out today. This is Old vs. New, West Side Story. <laughs> They love can tame all evil, and former street gang members in danger of relapsing are no exception. So now let's look at our male lead with Best Tony. You stay Tony, naturally based off of the character Romeo Montego, is portrayed by Richard Beimer and Ansel Algort respectively. Like said before, Tony was the former leader of the Jets with his best bud Riff, but retired after deciding he didn't want the violent lifestyle. The character is kind of bland, but still very likable and relatable, really capturing the essence of someone who sincerely wants to avoid crime, but still has the itch to return to it. I can't go to the dance, Riff! My parole officer said no going out! 
Plus, his chemistry with Maria is really endearing, and you're really hoping throughout the movie that the writers will take even more leeway from the original Romeo and Juliet story and give these two a happy ending. Now, whether or not they do, uh, we'll discuss a little later. Anyway, since I am comparing the two, I think I'm gonna give the slight edge to Richard Beimer in the original. The reason being that he feels a lot more like an ex-hoodlim, he often has that tough, macho street guy manner about how he talks, and also has a bit more of that playful, smart-ass persona. No! No! Uh, it's because I hate living with my bugging uncle! Come on! Uncle! Come on! Come on, uncle! I'm calling you all chicken. Big, tough buddy boys got throw bricks, huh? Afraid to get in close? Afraid to slug it out? Afraid to use plain skin? This not only makes him more believable, but also more entertaining. Ansel Elgort had a bit of this too, don't get me wrong. Gee Willick is Batman. Since when you carry a rod? Well, I don't got magic powers like you, Superman, so I got this. But we don't get quite as much of that as I'd like. When I see Elgort, I see more of a Troy Bolton wannabe than an ex-convict. Doesn't help much that Elgort played a similar character, Tommy Ross, in the Carrie remake. I will give the new Tony credit on the fact that we learn more about why he turned from crime, namely after how he nearly killed a kid and spent a year in prison. The original never really went into detail about what made Tony turn over a new leaf, and make no mistake, Elgort is still an A-plus actor. The emotional scenes like when Rift dies or when he's feeling the pressure of Rift to return to the life of crime are Best Actor Academy Award worthy. Hell, some of these scenes I feel he did even better than Beimer in the original. But yeah, he didn't feel quite as believable as Beimer did as a former street gang punk. Case in point, I don't know how many of you have read the original Romeo and Juliet story, but Romeo was also a cocky smartass in the play, so Beimer's Tony is also more loyal to the Shakespearean source material. Again, this one was close, but Elgort didn't quite capture the lovable smartass that Tony was as much as Beimer did in the original, and felt a bit too much like he was from a high school musical remake than one of West Side Story. Point goes to the old. When are you gonna grow up? <laughs> for our female lead. Another reason why I love this musical so much is, like with Bye Bye Birdie, it was way ahead of its time with a positive portrayal of interracial marriage, something almost unheard of at the time. I mean, sure, the original doesn't cast an actual Hispanic woman in the role, but, uh, like with Bye Bye Birdie, maybe I should just stop there. But anyway, it's now time for Maria. This is best Maria. You stay in the role of Maria, the story's Juliet Capulet, we have veteran actress Natalie Wood from Miracle on 34th Street and Gypsy, a newcomer but extremely talented Rachel Zegler. Like Tony, Maria's a chill, snarky, but very lovable smartass. Maybe not the most developed or best written character, but still very likable and entertaining. This one was the second hardest for me to decide. I'll tell you what the hardest one was a bit later, because both actresses nailed the character. But if you twisted my arm and forced me to pick, I'd say Rachel Zegler in the remakes got the slight upper hand for being a bit stronger of a character. Like in this version, we see many more scenes of her standing up to her con descending older brother Bernardo, who we'll discuss a bit later, and really owning him good. Maybe Gino and your friends fall down at your feet. And maybe you scare the Americanos when you make fists and angry faces. But yo no estoy interesada ni en boxeo, and I am not interested in what you have to say. Woods Marie only stood up to Bernardo in a playful, snarky way, which isn't quite as epic as Zegler's badass manner. Now granted, both versions call out both gangs for their stupid feud in the final act, armed with a gun no less, but I feel Zegler's a little more intense and badass. Watch the scenes back to back to see what I mean. Enough for you! And you! All of you! Enough for you! And you! See what I mean? Same applies for when Maria calls Tony out for murdering Bernardo. And then there's... Uh... Again, I'm having trouble finding much to compare with the two because they're both so awesome, but I gotta kill some time on this one. I do think Natalie Wood is a slightly better singer than Rachel Zegler, but only very, very slightly. 
but I think what sells it for me here is Maria is kind of the baby sister of her family, and even though Natalie Wood was only a few years older than Zegler when she did the role, I didn't really get the natural baby sister vibe from her, which is strange because this is the actress who played Susan Walker in the original Miracle on 34th Street. At any rate, Zegler gave off more of a natural youngest sibling vibe to her, which makes her more assertive nature all the more impressive. And again, this was an extremely close pick, even closer than with Tony in the previous round, but even though I love Natalie Wood, Rachel Zegler came off a bit stronger and felt more naturally like the baby of her family that the character is supposed to be, which is why she gets the point on this one. Point goes to the new. Why do you lie to me? <laughs> Romance stories and street thug stories may not share many things in common, but they do have one big similarity. They wouldn't be nearly as exciting without some awesome villains, be it a romance forbidding parent or rival lover in the case of the romance story, or a corrupt cop or especially violent thug member in the case of the street gang story. And since West Side Story is both of those story types, it has all of the aforementioned villains. So let's see which one of these bad guys are more intimidating with Best Villains. You stay Okay, villains might be a bit strong of a word. There's not really any straightforward villains in the story, just side characters who are not supportive to our leads. But villains is a far more exciting category name. Anyway, the closest thing we have to a straightforward villain is probably Maria's older brother Bernardo, who's kind of a mix of Juliet's father Lord Capulet, forcing her to marry against her will, and Juliet's cousin Tilbutt, who the male lead kills after he kills the male lead's best friend. The character is a cocky and somewhat chauvinistic control freak. Hell, he won't even let Maria go to college in the new film, so much so that Maria gets over his death almost immediately, and Anita, his girlfriend, does shortly after as well. I'll talk more about Anita a bit later, but he's not completely unsympathetic, as he points out to the girls through the song, I Like to Be in America, life in 1950s America is hardly any better for non-white immigrants than in their home country. You still have crappy below minimum wage jobs, but now with higher living expenses and people assuming the worst of you based on your skin color, so it's implied that he started the Sharks in order to support his sister and girlfriend in this world of prejudice and poverty they live in, and does want what's best for his little sis with this arranged marriage to Chino even if he is pretentious and belittling about it. But the portrayals are a bit different, and personally, I enjoyed the original played by George Charcaris a little bit more. David Alvarez in the remake plays him like a tough, violent thug, which is fitting with the character, and Alvarez gives an A-plus acting performance. If I can be with a colored girl like her, I'll be somebody better than I was. Somebody i never been before. But Charcris plays Bernardo more like a sleazy, conniving mafia boss. The pleasure is mine. Let's go outside. I would not leave the ladies here alone with your kind around. When I get through with you, you will be like a fish after skinning. I like this depiction more because, one, I think it's more entertaining, and two, it kind of shows how seriously Bernardo takes his New York teenage street gang business to the point where he feels the need to act like a good feather. I mean, good fella. Sorry, the Goodfellas parody of West Side Story just came to mind. What about Officer Krupke and Lieutenant Shrink? Again, I know it's kind of debatable on whether or not they're truly villains, since they're just doing their jobs by keeping the streets safe from these hoodlums and never do anything illegal, but they are still antagonists to the main characters and also pretty racist, so they qualify for the villains category as far as I'm concerned. Anyway, let's start with Lieutenant Shrink, based on Prince Aeschylus from the original Shakespearean story. While both do well at being Iron Fisted, Long Arms, The Lol, I think I gotta go with the original again. He seems a bit more racist and condescending towards the Sharks, almost making focus on the family look accepting. I get a promotion and you Puerto Ricans get what you've been itching for. So what if they do turn this whole town into a stinking pigsty? Hey, don't stop him! He wants to get home right if you let us to San Juan. Tell him how he's got it made over here! That, matched with Simon Oakland's natural sleazy smugness, helps make him all the more unlikable despite the fact that he's a police officer. Also compare how he tries to find out where the rumble is in both versions. In the remake, he just tries to intimidate the Jets at the station, but in the original, he actually tries to convince them that he wants to aid them with it to get rid of the sharks. And given how racist he is, that's not entirely implausible. Truth 
threw the jet saw right through the charade and kept quiet, but that admittedly was a very clever plan and shows a bit more brains with the character than in the remake. And as for Krupke, both depictions are really amusing as the pathetic tough guy wannabe that can't keep either gang in line to save his life, but I felt the original was a bit more pathetic, and thus it was more amusing to watch both gangs torment him. So, another point to the original, and I guess the last villain I can really think of is Bernardo's best bud Chino, based on Juliet's fiancé Paris. He's... pretty boring, to be honest. He just doesn't have much character outside of being Bernardo's best friend, and is really only considered a villain because he takes over the sharks after Bernardo's death, and... Actually, I don't want to say any more about that until the best story round. But anyway, which one is less bland? Well, despite the streak the originals had with the villains thus far, I do think the remix Chino has a little bit more of a character as a lovable nerd, which makes his conversion to thuggery all the more sad. There's also a subplot of how he wants to join the Sharks, but Bernardo won't let him because he doesn't want that life for him. Kind of an interesting angle. So kudos for getting one villain right remake, but since I like three of the four bad guys better in the original, Old takes the win on this one. Point goes to the Old. Not on my watch. <laughs> But even though interracial marriage was considered taboo back in the late 1950s, it did still have its supporters. So let's see who was more supportive to our romantic leads with Best Supporting Cast. You stay if you're a Spielberg fan and are pissed with how one-sided the unlikable side characters round was towards the original, then you're in luck because the likable side characters round definitely leans more towards the remake. Well, likable-ish, anyway. Let's start with Riff, based off of Romeo's best friend Mercutio. Both Russell Tamblin and Mike Face are very entertaining as the laid-back snarky punk that Riff is, but aren't saints either because, well, he's a street gang punk and makes some pretty racist jabs at the sharks. Anyway, I lean towards Mike Face's Riff for two reasons. One, I feel Mike Faced was a bit more naturally rugged and street gangish than Russell Tamblin. And two, the remake devotes a little more time to how he really misses his best bud Tony and wants him to get over almost killing that kid and rejoin him with leading the Jets. What I almost done? You gotta get over that. What is the point in beating yourself up? I wanna be unlike how I was. But through the song Crazy Boy, which I'll discuss in the next round, Tony gets it through to Riff that he's not interested in that lifestyle anymore. This ups Riff's chemistry with Tony and gives him a bit more dimension to his character, making him more engaging. Hell, just see the look on his face as he dies in Tony's arms. So, one point to the remake. How about Anita, who's a mix of the Capulet Nurse and Friar Lawrence? Okay, I know the character of Doc, who I'll discuss a little later, is allegedly the Friar Lawrence in this story, but I personally feel Anita shares more similarities to the character. Anyway, Anita's a chill, snarky deadbeat, but still a very loving and supportive mentor to Maria, and isn't crazy about Tony, and killing Bernardo doesn't help much with that, needless to say, but is willing to support their love in any way she can for Maria's sake. This was also a close pick, but I think I have to give this one to the remake again for four reasons. One, I felt she was slightly more supportive towards Maria. Just slightly, though. Two, the character is supposed to be an older, wiser-ish mentor to Maria, but there never seemed to be a huge age difference between the two in the original. The age difference is more obvious here. Three, Ariana DeBose actually won the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress with her performance and was the only cast member of the remake to even win an Oscar. And four, Rita Marino, who played her in the original, flat out said that she thought DeBose did better as the character. But if you are a Rita Marino fan, then you're in luck because she plays Doc in the remake, or Valentina in this version, and the character is vastly superior. Don't get me wrong, the one the original played by Ned Glass was good too, but I feel Marino's character was better written, not just because she's female, kudos towards diverse casting, but she's also Puerto Rican and thus also subject to the jet slimy racism, but thankfully not to Krupke or Shranks. So as you can imagine, while Riff is trying to lead Tony down the wrong path again, she encourages Tony to stay on the good path and not go back to his racist criminal ways. Oh, you love Riff, but he hates Puerto Ricans. That is not you. Plus, the two have such a great adoptive mother and son bond, 
I think a big part of that is in this version, she also had an interracial lover in her youth, and keep in mind that in the late 50s, that was really taboo, so she can relate to the difficulties he's going through making this work in this racist world they live in. The original Doc and Tony had a nice bond too, but it didn't seem quite as meaningful as in the remake. Like, slapping Tony to get bad news through to him seemed a little extreme. But I feel the character who got the biggest upgrade in the remake was anybody's. The character in both versions is a tomboy whose lifelong dream is to be a jet, but the misogynist gang has zero interest in her application. She is a little annoying and doesn't have much purpose to the story, but you do still feel for her. But you definitely feel more for the Spielberg version thanks to a neat spin on the character. In this version, she doesn't just want to join the Jets, she, or rather they, are transgender and firmly want to identify only as a male. She's a girl! I said I ain't no goddamn girl, you shrivel dick dago pansy! But since this is the politically incorrect late 50s, this only causes the Jets to look down on them even more, so this makes their issues of not fitting in all the more dramatic and identifiable. Plus, the new one is slightly less annoying than the original, so this boosts our sympathy for them even more so. Again, both films have great side characters on the whole, but the ones in the remake are just slightly better performed and also a lot more developed. So Spielberg earns the point on this one. Point goes to the new. WAKE UP! <laughs> Hey guys, here are the folks again, visiting them for Easter. Hi, happy Hello. Easter! Happy Easter. So once again, it's all tied up, so let's see which West Side Story adaptation comes out on top tonight with Best Story and Music. You stay Let me start off by saying that I've only seen both these movies for the first time a few months ago, but West Side Story is now my new favorite musical ever. It's funny, it's exciting, it's emotional, it's well written, and it follows the plot of Romeo and Juliet as faithfully as the 50s New York street gang setting would allow. And both movies were made by prodigy directors who each stayed true to the original musical while also giving their own unique spin. And remember how I said Maria was the second hardest to decide? Well, story and music were the hardest here because there seems to be pros and cons to each director's take on the musical. For instance, the original's low budget was fairly obvious, with the sets being a bit more, well, set-like, and not a very wide range of locations. Again, musicals it's a bit more understandable, but in film, you have no excuse. Staying in only so many locations gets kind of old after a while. The remake took advantage of its much higher budget and presented a much larger variety of locations. Like in this version, the Jets seeing Officer Krupke in the police station while being interrogated about the rumble. Very fitting. But with that said, the original did make the most of its lower budget and gave the cheap sets a very distinct artsy street gang look and feel. This really helped give the original its own unique identity, which may be a part of why it's so highly remembered. Like, let's look at both versions of my personal favorite song from the show, The Tonight Quintet. In the original, Tony and Maria sing the song in only one location for the most part, but in the Spielberg film, we see them walking through Manhattan in some pretty nice settings. Also, while Anita in the original sings her line about having sex with Bernardo after the rumble in her bed dressing like a stripper, in the remake she sings about it in church. How freaking hilarious is that? We also get some bits like the Jets gathering their weapons to prepare for the rumble, and also Krupke and Shrink organizing their West Side Wide police patrol to find and stop stop the rumble, these really add to the drama. Again, there's a very limited variety of locations for this song in the original, but it made the most of it by casting this eerie, unsettling red light for the majority of it. It clearly fits for when the sharks and jets are singing about bashing each other's heads in, sure, but notice how the same unnerving light is casting when Tony, Maria, and Anita are singing joyfully about their dreams coming true at last? This subtly foreshadows how tonight is not going to be a pleasant night for them either ingenious. How about the music itself? Again, each film has its advantages. Namely, while I feel the remake's orchestration sounded slightly better, I feel the singing in the original had just a little bit more passion to it. Like, let's listen to these bits of the song, I Feel Pretty. I feel pretty, oh so pretty. I feel pretty and witty and gay. I feel pretty, oh so pretty. I feel pretty and witty and bright. Or how about Robert Wise changing the order of some of the songs like he did with The Sound of Music? While it worked perfectly in that movie, here, 
Again, there are some things that are better than the original, and some things that are better in the remake. Like, I hear he moved the more lighthearted song, I Feel Pretty, to the second act because the second act was more lighthearted, and he felt it would fit better there. Same reason for why he moved the darker number, Crazy Boy, to the darker third act. And yes, this does help the original maintain a more consistent tone throughout the movie, but it also hampers the drama in some regards. Like finding out that her lover murdered her own brother right after singing a sweet song about how much she was in love with him was a pretty dramatic and ironic moment for Maria in the story. Also, while having the new Jets leader sing Crazy Boy to a member of the gang to have him get over Riff's death was also intense, having Tony sing it to Riff had the advantages of Tony putting more effort into his promise to Maria to try and stop the rumble, and also dramatically getting through to Riff that he's not interested in street gang life anymore. So yeah, it doesn't really seem like either film outshines the other, does it? So does that mean it's going to be a tie like in my Fright Night or Worst Witch review? Well, almost, but I did say at the beginning that I felt one of these movies was slightly better, and that film is... The Original! But the big deciding point on that was the ending. What do I mean? Well, let me paraphrase how the original Romeo and Juliet story ends. Basically, Friar Lauren suggests Juliet take a drug that'll put her in a death-like coma for 48 hours so her family will think she's dead and put her in a tomb, but he'll tell Romeo about the plan and he'll be waiting for her when she wakes up and they can run off together. But the Friar's messenger gets quarantined, Romeo never gets the message about the plan, poisons himself upon learning Juliet's allegedly dead, Juliet stabs herself when she wakes up and realizes Romeo is really dead, but the Capulets and Montagos finally make peace. So yeah, I knew from the beginning that this climax was going to be a bit harder to translate to modern times than the rest of the story, but I think the musical did it pretty well. Here, Maria and Tony are planning to elope the night after the disastrous rumble, but Maria gets delayed when Shrank arrives to question her about Bernardo's murder. So Anita goes to tell Tony about the delay, but the Jets start racially harassing her at the shop out of bitterness towards Bernardo killing Riff, and she in bitterness towards the Jets tells Doc that Maria got killed by Chino. Doc tells Tony the alleged bad news, Tony is traumatized, and goes off to find Chino and basically beg him to put him out of his misery. But then he sees Maria! I I'd say so far that this ending resembles the original Romeo and Juliet ending about mm, 50% maybe. So when I was watching the original for the first time a few months ago, I was really curious about whether or not they keep the ending where both lovers die or let them live. The two start to slowly head off towards each other, and I was totally invested. The tension was terrible, and... Both my guesses were kind of right, since Tony does end up getting shot by Riff, but Maria does not. The Spielberg version, I'm sad to say, completely botched this scene up. Here, Chino pops up from behind Tony just a couple seconds after seeing Maria's alive and shoots him almost immediately. So much for suspense. It's like Spielberg basically said, eh, let's just wrap this thing up. Enough people already know how the story ends. Well, I sure didn't Spielberg, and if I had seen the remake first, I would have been pretty disappointed about how that question racing my mind throughout the story was answered. But again on the whole, both adaptations are astounding to say the least, and each have their own distinct advantages. But mostly because of the ending, I have to give the very slight final edge to the original Robert Wise adaptation. Spielberg, I love your adaptation, but the Robert Wise old just barely takes home the gold. No! <laughs> So what's next for me, you guys might wonder? Well, you may remember the last time I visited my parents, I announced I was doing a crossover with Murray Reactions. And guess what? We're doing another one. And guess what else? It's a musical. What is the musical? Why don't we let old Thomas tell you? Well, gentlemen, you have intrigued me. I have to give Iowa a try. So we'll be seeing you soon down in old Iowa. But just in case Thomas is watching this and he might be doing a reaction to this video, let me play a song for him that I just know he loves. Don't let your love fly away, fly away, don't be afraid to seize the day. Am I a stinker?